All right, good afternoon. Thanks everyone for showing up and hopefully your food doesn't kick in too fast and knock you out. I'll yell every few minutes just to get, you, get your heads off the table. It's a privilege to be here. My name is Tyler Mitchell. I'm a product manager for the Couchbase SDK product. Um, Clarence is gonna follow up my talk after a few minutes. You might as well sit down so you don't, you, you can sit down if you want. Okay, the, um, we're gonna cover off a few topics, uh, kind of a bit of a range of things. Uh, data models, uh, we'll, we'll talk about at the end. And I'm going to talk about our data structures API and our sub-document API. Oh, sorry, there's our, that's what we're talking about today. And I wanted to note at the, the fourth bullet there that immediately following this session at two o'clock is another great session where you'll dive more into what our SDK, what APIs are available for you to build on Couchbase with. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about them almost in passing, but if you wanna do the deep dive, then uh, Michael's talk next is uh, really good too. So I work with our SDK team and our goal is really to make your complex data access easy. So when you're building your applications on top of Couchbase, we want your application to get as tight and close to Couchbase as possible with minimal amount of effort. So uh, it kind of goes without saying, but that is our goal and when you see this, the APIs we're talking about today, keep that in mind that our goal is to help that integration be easy and tight and help it to, to be kind of, what I'm saying, transparent across languages, implemented in the similar fashion, depending on, uh, no matter what language you're using from our SDK. So uh, function names and calls and things, we, we try to align them all so that you can shift and switch as appropriate and still have the same usage and expectation as a developer. So first we we'll talk about what we're calling our data structures API. We have it available right now as an experimental uh, test uh, product. We are targeting that it's going to be released in our SDK package with Couchbase 4.6 in the new year. So our SDK development cycles, we try to bundle up all our goodness in the SDK along the way, and when the server comes out with new stuff, we, we do deliver them at the same time usually. But because all of our uh, SDK products are um, open source, you can go and get the, the interim builds that we're doing all the time for the different SDKs. So don't, don't necessarily wait always to that main release cycle. Um, don't be afraid to come in and try out and test the sub-document and, and uh, data structures APIs I'm talking about today because they're available in, the, in, in these languages already. Uh, we'll take questions after, yeah. Um, but it does build on top of the sub-document API, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, which was implemented in 4.5. So it is, does depend on 4.5. Yeah. Uh, who's already using 4.5? Anybody? Great, anybody already using sub-document API? Okay, great, so this is, all, this is all new and I'll slow down and maybe spend a bit more time on those topics for you. But the idea is that we've got uh, uh, JSON data in the background, we want, we kind of have our own implied uh, understanding of what some of the types are in, in JSON when you map them into your application. And we wanna make that kind of mapping easy for you to remove some of the layers of converting data between types from JSON or maybe strings into a, a lit, from a list into a, a list in your language. We wanna kind of streamline that for you and that's what the Data Structures API does. So we've implemented maps, lists, sets, and queues and um, there's functions, I'll go over each of them in a minute. And I specifically wanted to point out our, our Java collections framework and .NET system collections frameworks are, are really well supported with some of the more advanced features you'd expect from those. Um, so you can do your, your, any kind of operations you're used to doing with those frameworks without having to um, kind of make your, own, make your own way of doing it. And then in the other languages that we support, we have support for the data structures as well that you can call with functions. I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. But here's kind of my, my simple, oversimplified understanding of the world when we're talking about typical document data access, that you've got these kind of three stages. You, you've got Couchbase, serves up a document, or one of our SDKs will give you a JSON object back, and then your application that you're programming might convert that into a collections framework 
uh, or some kind of array object or something like that. Uh, we want to sh shorten that up by pulling out, give, delivering the collections to you um, directly from your call to the Couchbase server or from the SDK. Data structure SDK, that's what the, the DS means there. So for example, you might have a, uh, an object there that has a faves uh, a array or a list in it, and you can request just give me the faves, and that faves gets mapped directly to an object that you can iterate through. So that's pretty much what we're talking about, and uh, it's, that's why in a 50 minute talk, I'm not just talking about this because there's not a lot more to really, really understand, but it's that targeted, focused um, approach to say, give me this uh, uh, list, give me a map, uh, give me a set, give me a queue, and map it straight into the language, how the language understands that for you. And then it, likewise, it can go the other way around. So you can target specific updates as well just to that specific type of data in the back end. So all the stuff in the back end stays as JSON data. Um, the SDKs all are programmed to understand how to convert those into native types for you depending on what you're calling them and how you're referring to them. And we can update them back into the database. So as I've said, we've got four different data structure types here that we're looking at. And each of them are a little, little different. So lists and maps are kind of the two fundamental types. I won't read through all of this, but you, know, you have a JSON array or you have JSON objects. Um, those are lists and those are maps. And some examples on the right-hand side there, um, sets excuse me, sets and queues are kind of a specialized version of a list, really, in this context, where you've got sets that are unique values, um, so you can just keep adding new items to them, removing them, and it will still always be unique. And then in the queues side, we've got, you know, lists of things where you can push in new values, pull out a value, um, which, you know, like a job queue or something like that would be useful to have this capability. And just having the ability to just ask for what the size of these uh, structures are um, without having to go through your own, writing your own functions to do it, might be useful for you as well. And we have um, consistent access across all languages. So like I was saying before, where our function names are all aligned and our uh, approach to changing and updating and getting information through these data types are, are all consistent as well. And we have, like I said before too, we've got two different approaches, a functional approach where we've got some functions you can use to do these things. And then if you're using .NET or, or Java collections, you can use those specific structures to, or those frameworks to the way that you normally would too. So in this uh, simple functional examples here, you can see that we have uh, functions for getting lists. Um, we can just get it, we give the document key, and we get a list back in this case in Python. We get a list back and we can do whatever we do with lists. Uh, hopefully you'll do more than just print the list, um, but uh, I didn't want to fill up a whole slide with just uh, Python output. And then, um, so all of our languages kind of support these methods for interacting with these different data, the data types. And then some of the more advanced capabilities of the collections frameworks are available as well. So we've kind of added a little bit more to your, your ability to do stuff. So you see a .NET uh, examples, uh, the, or sorry, a Java example, and then three .NET examples there for how you'd interact with uh, lists and maps, sets and queues. So that's pretty much in a nutshell what our data structure capability is um, allowing you to do, allowing you to access kind of subsets of documents, and not just subsets of documents, but mapping those subsets back into through the API into structures that your language knows how to use already. So hopefully that cuts out one little layer of understanding for you or um, a little bit of work, less work for you to do. I want to talk a, a minute about our sub-document API and as, a, as none of you were really saying you were using it, I thought I'd give you the definition here that it allows you to access parts of the JSON document uh, efficiently without requiring the transfer of the entire document over the network. So it improves performance and brings better efficiency to the network I.O. path, especially when working with large JSON documents. Who's working with large JSON documents here? Anybody working with large? Say, you'd, you know, it's like, oh, mine's bigger than yours. You know, nobody's, nobody really knows what large would be, I guess. 
But the idea that you can target sub portions of a document is really important when you're going to go scale. Especially, you, maybe the servers keep up, but then your network gets saturated. You want to make sure that as much as possible, you're letting the server do all the work. And that's really what this, this capability is all about. Um, so this is all server side. It's not like a client side API um, implementation to allow the sub documents. The sub documents is all server side, so you're sending, the, the SDK is sending the commands back to the server and it's doing all the work there whether it's just pulling information out or whether it's setting stuff in the back end. And we've got, uh, this is like I was mentioning, we have the data structures API actually sits on top of our sub-document API. If we didn't have the sub-document capabilities in the server, we couldn't do a lot of what we're doing on the, on the data structures side. So here's just examples of how we kind of abstract it, make it a little simpler. This, these are just three examples from the, the map uh, data type and how they work in the sub-document API. So we won't, I won't elaborate on this at all, but we've tried to simplify things so that you don't need to even, if you, all you care about is getting access to an array in your list comprehension in your language, um, then data structures is enough for you. But if you want to get a little lower level and dig below that surface, you can uh, do a lot more with the sub-document API. There's two primary methods for interacting with sub-documents. One is uh, the lookup in, and you'll see the, the operation there. You can actually, or the, uh, the function there, and then you give it a, a document key, and then you give it uh, an operation and a path. So a path is a, a, a movement through the, the JSON document. I'll show you an example in a second. It might just be um, the name of a JSON object or, or an array. And then that, within that lookup in, we can do multiple types of operations. We can get information, we can check if it exists, and we can do execute, which I'll show you in a sec. And then for doing updates and, and changes, mutate in is the function that we use. And you can see a list of all the different f operations that we allow there. I did want to point out that we uh, have implemented a method of kind of chaining the operations together. So if you, so we've, you, you might want to make like sub documents so efficient that you might be able to just call really small bits of requests over and over, but we've even made it more advanced so you could bundle all of that and batch it up so you can do a whole bunch of these small updates and changes all at once as well. So we've kind of really made it as efficient as possible. I gave an example of the output there, but I'll show you it on this slide instead because it's a little more meaningful. So we're going to look up, we're going to look up one specific key. Uh, this person called Copilot Mark from our couch based music example. We're going to get just the phone, the phones, uh, in the phones object, we're going to get, see what it has set for a number. And you can see, then we do an execute. So you can chain all these things together and then fire off the execute and it does all of the stages that have been defined above. So we can say we can, we can check if something exists, we can get it, and we can change it um, in, in the mutate functions. We can chain, make those changes. So we have a replace and upsert options in there. So that's pretty much it on the sub-document API side. Again, you know, you need, if you haven't upgraded to 4.5 and you want these features, it's time to do it. Um, and then watch for the, the, the data structures API uh, when it gets released in uh, the 4.6 timeframe with the main couch base release. So I'm gonna hand over next, we're gonna talk about data modeling and it's over to Clarence. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, Tyler discussed about uh, the data structures, and I'll be discussing about the data modeling. So what, uh, what is data modeling? So data, mo data modeling is uh, uh, essentially designing your data in the way how it best suits your application. So usually, it's, it's a progression, of, uh, progression from conceptual data model to logical data model to a physical data model, where in conceptual model, you just have the high level you identify the entities at a very high level in your data. That's what you do in conceptual data models. Say, I have a track document. I have um, a, a pet document, a doctor document, a music document, and so on. Uh, and identify the relationship between different entities. While in physical data model, you really map these documents to your couch-based model. Say, 
should I create different buckets? Should I create different buckets? So should I have a track bucket and a music bucket? Should I have an artist bucket? Or should I have only one bucket where I have different documents uh, and I, I have a way how I can identify what different documents are? So again, data modeling is full of choices that you need to do. And that is what we'll be discussing about. So if, if you are from relational world, uh, you must have heard about normalization, right? We normalize and normalize and normalize. And why do we do that? It's mostly for uh, consistency and to avoid duplication of the data. So we say no duplication of the data. Uh, so you have data, minimum data inconsistencies and reduced update costs, which means no duplicate data, and you're preserving storage resources. But when we talk about no SQL databases or Couchbase, so we talk about relaxed normalization. That is, we often say to ourselves, it's, it's OK to repeat the data. Okay? You'll have to make a choice there. Do I need a direct references? Or can I embed the data? Which means, is it OK to repeat the data? The idea there is, I need to increase the speed. Flexibility to scale my entire model is what is I'm looking for, instead of you know, padding all uh, the elements with null, like how you used to do in a relational table. So what we have in NoSQL is relaxed normalization. So modeling Couchbase documents. So we know that Couchbase is a document database with a key value approach, right? Uh, you have a key and a value. So you can model both the key, so we have key modeling, as well as did uh, the data, the value part, the data modeling. So the data itself can be a very simple string, or it could be an XML document, it could be a JSON document, or it could be anything that you want. It could be an encrypted string as well. So, but usually when we're talking about Couchbase, it is tuned or it's geared to store JSON documents. So generally when we are data modeling with Couchbase, we are talking with tuning JSON documents. So, and most of the tools that are built on Couchbase uh, assume that you're storing it on JSON and you want to tune the JSON data. Example, Nickel. So Nickel works on JSON data. It assumes that you are querying on JSON data in Couchbase buckets. So why JSON? So JSON is lightweight interchange format. It's based on JavaScript. It's, it's programming language independent. And over time, we know JSON has thankfully replaced XML. XML we used to use, which was like quite verbose than JSON. And thankfully, over years, we are completely replaced or almost replaced XML structures with JSON structures. And why JSON? Very, very important schema flexibility. And that is what we get by using JSON. Uh, and what we do not get when you're using relational database. Okay, and of course it's less verbose and can represent structures like objects and arrays, which XML structure could not represent well. Okay, and very important thing, there's no impedance mismatch between a JSON document and a Java object. You can just take a JSON, do JSON document, cast it to your Java object, and that's, that's the biggest advantage that we get. While if you're working with a relational database, you need a middle layer that converts, converts the, you know, a table row or whatever it is to a Java object, like you used to use Hibernate or some kind of ORM tool, right? Here, there's no impedance mismatch, so your JSON object gets converted to your Java object directly. So coming to the data modeling, so what are the various design choices we have when you're data modeling JSON documents? Various choices. So of course, I'll divide this into two parts, the body, the JSON document itself, and the key the key part, because Couchbase is a key value store, right? So we, I'll talk about key modeling in a while. So what are the various design choices? We, uh, we have a choice to choose between a single root element or to have a type attribute embedded. The choice between objects or arrays. How do you deal with array elements? What are the various timestamp formats that we can deal with? How do you handle property names? How do you handle empty, missing, and null attributes? You know, these are the things because uh, JSON can have elements that are empty, and JSON documents need not have an element itself. Two different JSON documents can have different elements, right? And that's the schema flexibility that we get, which we do not get in a relational document. In a relational 
say data in a relational table if there is uh, if there is a field that's missing you would pad that with null but in a json document probably you'll just drop that field you can consider dropping that field at least instead of having or padding that with null and the advantage here what we get even by dropping the values is since there is no impedance mismatch in your object model and json model you can take that and directly cast to an object model that is your java object and the values that are missing will automatically be padded with null because your instance variables are by default null right so let's talk about root attributes and embedded attributes so look at your look at the document at, uh, on your left the the root element of this document is track while the document on your right does not have a root element rather i have a type attribute that says it is track so these are two ways how i can identify what document it is so if i have a root element here as track i know it's a track document if I, if the root element is artist i can identify it's an artist document if the root element is pet it's a pet document if the root element is employee it's a employee document or a user document while the other way is i have a flat structure i do not have a root element rather i have a type element where i say type is track a type is user type is pet so that's one way how i can do this so what's the change needed in the first case you can see my query changes my query would be select track dot star so i am referring select track that's the root root element track dot star so i want everything within the track okay from couch music which is the bucket name in this case it's a nickel query while in the other case i'm going to say select star from couch music i want everything from couch music where type is equal to track so where type is equal to user where type is equal to pet so every query i can identify or every object i can distinguish between two objects by using the where clause now the advantage with this one is you can index by type so if you have five different types of document you can create an index on type so because we assume here every query that you are writing will have a where clause which is at least comparing the type because you want to retrieve of the document of a particular type right you you just can't say okay select star from the bucket limit 10 because it's going to give do, uh, documents which are of different types and you ca can't cast it to a single object or an array of objects you need of a particular type you need all the pet documents all the user documents what's the other choice the other choice is the choice between objects and arrays look at the object uh, look at the document on your left where it says phones and it's an object that's embedded while on your right you have an array of phones so how does your object model change in this case you can see the this class user profile which has a phone the object being embedded okay and the phone is here the class phone has say cell or landline or uh, you know whatever phone number while in the other case if you have an array here you're going to create a list of phone if you have more than one phones for that uh, for a user so let me go previous slide again so in this case you'll have to have here multiple types of phones that a person will have while in this case you have an array of phones I do not say which one is better. I do not say this one is better over other. I just want to say this is the choice that you have while you're data modeling the JSON documents. The other choice that you have is array element types. The document on your left has array of strings, while the document on your right has array of objects. So very clearly, the document on your left is a track. Uh, represents a track arrays you know you can see a track is an array type which has track ids what are these ids these are ids of a different document right so now if i uh, so this would be the object model representation for that so i would have a list of tracks and you can see uh, the list is of string type which means the list of track ids right so when i am trying to access a track i would get the track first 
and then I would get the uh, get the track document with the track ID, which means there's two gets. There's a get here and there's a get here, which means you're hitting the Couchbase server twice to get uh, get the value of the track or get the entire track. So now the question is, do you want to do multiple gets here? Is it worth it? Sometimes, yes. I do not say uh, this approach might not be the best one always. Let's, let's take uh, uh, an example of blogs. So when you have blogs, it's, it's not recommended to uh, have the entire blog embedded within as a string. So otherwise your document is going to grow at some point of time and it's going to exceed Couchbase limit as well, which is 20 MB per document. So that's the time when probably referring works very well. But certain times you can also consider you don't have to always refer documents. Because we, when we come from relational relational background, and uh, I've been working with NoSQL from the last five years, still you, the first approach that I do is the foreign key referencing because I come from the relational background and uh, you know there's a lot of unlearning that I have to do, but ultimately you know, I keep telling myself, hey, there is a paradigm shift that needs to be done. Okay, it, it's okay to repeat the data at a certain point of time. Okay, so that, that comes over time anyway. So in this case, uh, you can see it's an array of tracks that's embedded here. So now the advantage here is I can just get the tracks. It's, it's getting the whole tracks here. Okay, and tracks.get of one will get me the first track, and I can get the artist name directly. While in the previous case, I had to get the list of tracks and then get the track again and then get the artist name. While in this case, with a single get, I'm, I'm getting the whole playlist, which also has tracks embedded. Various other choices with timestamp formats. Ti working with timestamp has been always very complicated. Uh, at least not very easy, uh, that's what uh, I would say. So there are various choices for you. You can store the timestamp in, in string format, so it's much readable. You can store time in epoch, so the unique style. Or you can store also in the array of components. Well, actually this looks funny, but definitely there is a meaning to it which we'll be discussing in a while. So first let's discuss about some observed practices uh, while using timestamp formats. So storing as epoch will help you to easily sort the documents. So you can just say if you wanted the documents to be stored, say in the order of the last update time, like in the previous example here, you can see the last update time say updated, I'm storing the document or storing the date as epoch. So the advantage here is I can just say select star from couch music where type is equal to track, order by updates in descending order. So the most recently updated track will be on the top. So storing, as, storing date as an array format, that is in the previous slide, you can see the updated is in the terms in, in array. It also helps, especially when you're grouping. So let's, let's see what it means. So if you have worked with views, uh, th there is something called as group and group level. So what happens, so grouping options can be specified to control the execution of the view. And the group and group level options are only useful when the reduce function has been defined on the correspond corresponding view. So if you have a reduce function, say sum or count as the reduce function, only then group and group level is useful. So what group level does is, the group level option used when the key is an array. So it can be used only when the key is an array. And in my previous example, I'm storing the date as an array and I can emit as the, uh, as the key of the view, okay? So which determines how many elements of the key are used when aggregating the results. Let us see what it means. Look at this example. The key value pair, uh, uh, you know how views are emitted, right? Views are emitted in key and value pair. So it's a new key and value, okay? Not the actual key. key. It, it retains the actual key while it emits a new key and a value. So you can see the new key which is of array type and the value is three. So now I'm specifying here, I want to sum that with a group level of one. So what it means is, consider only the first element of the array and sum that. So you can see here when I'm reducing it or executing it, so you can see it's only taking the first part of the array 
Okay, only considering the first element of the array, that is 2014 and 2015s. And it's reducing to the sum, because my reduce function is sum. So you can see the sum value is 36 here and 26 here. Let's take that with 2. When I'm taking the group level as 2 here, it's considering the first two elements. So when I execute the reduce function, so you can see, it's, it's considering the first two elements. So 2014 and 11, the sum is 3. 2014 and 12, the sum is 33. And 2015 and 1 is 20. So it's taking the first two elements. It's considering the first two elements. If I execute the view with group level as 3, it's considering the first three elements. So look at that. So it, it's certainly advantageous to store, uh, you know, date in, in array format, provided you have a use case like this. Okay, so dealing with empty null and empty null and missing property values. So we need to keep in mind that JSON supports optional property values between two documents also. Say I have a pet owner document, say two pet owner documents, one inside a pet owner document, it, it's possible that one has appointment document and the one other the one does not have at all because he hasn't just hasn't booked any appointments or it's a, it's like empty appointment list. So how do I query especially for null values, empty values, and uh, some missing values. So let's look at what they are first. So when you, so let's consider this as the sample document. So with country code, currency code, and region. So in this document, the region is not missing because it's, it's there. It's not null either because it has Europe and is valued because region has some value and the value is Europe. While in this case, the region is not missing because that, that field is available. Region is not null either. It's not null, but is not valued. It's empty. It's not valued. While in the third case, you can see here, there's no region. So region is missing. While in this case, you can see explicitly in region is null. So usually the best practice is you can always consider dropping uh, the attribute from the JSON model, especially if the attribute is missing. You can consider dropping it instead of padding it with null explicitly because the object model is so good, it does not have impedance mismatch, it's going to convert your JSON object to Java object. Okay, JSON schema. Couchbase does not validate your document. Definitely it does not valid, validate your document against any schema. All it checks if the document is well formed, that's it. So that is why you can store even a simple string or documents that is completely unrelated. So certain times you might want to check for some schema of the document. And remember, Couchbase is not responsible for this you are responsible for this in your data layer. So JSON schema is one of uh, the things that you need to use if you want to uh, make sure you have some structure for the document. So that's an example of JSON schema. You have JSON schema which provides, or oh, this is a little small on the slide, but uh, I can read it out. So what are the various properties that you can have? The properties are like country code, GDP, name, population, and things like that. And what are the various, what's the various type? You can see at the country code, the type is string. The min length is two, the max length is two. So I'm giving the, the type of the document and the uh, the size of the document in string, it has to be minimum two characters and maximum two characters. Let's take exam another example, GDP. The type is integer and the minimum value should be zero. It cannot be negative. So I'm specifying something with the schema. So various other things like min length, max length, format, pattern. And you can see the required field here again, which says, okay, are, what are the fields that are required? Are all these fields required? Are, this, there, are there some fields which are optional? And also it says additional properties, false and true, whichever. So if you say additional properties as false, other than the one that are specified in the schema, you cannot add any additional properties. So you have to have all those properties. So the required properties, 
the additional properties which is disabled and so on. Okay, data nesting. So relational database design promotes separating data using normalization, which does not scale. So while for NoSQL, like I discussed earlier, we have relaxed normalization so that it can scale. So what we do is we try to nest the documents as much as possible. Okay, it's, it's always not necessary that you do nesting. Rather, I would say, I would leave it to your wisdom. Okay, when, when you nest and when you do not nest. Okay, uh, but we'll talk about some best practices when you should probably nest. So the rule of thumb again is, you should not have more than three levels of nesting. If there are more than three levels of nesting, you can always consider to have that in a different document. Okay, or even if the document, uh, you know, document is like larger and larger and larger, you can consider it to separate into a different document. So let's take an example, say example one of data nesting. Uh, look at this document, you have a playlist document and a user profile document. The playlist document has an owner which refers, it's like your foreign key relationship. It refers to the username or the key of another document. So I need to do a get on playlist and take the name of the owner and do a get of that key, which will give me this document. So while in the data nesting case, what I'm doing, instead of me only specifying the ID here, which I, like which I did in the previous case, what I'm going to do, I am going to partially embed the document. See, the whole document is not embedded. Only a part of the document is embedded. So when I do a get of playlist, I get the entire playlist plus a part of the owner document or the most frequently used attributes of the owner document, not the entire document. But if something is missing here and I really wanted that, you can always do a get again. But the most frequently one, especially if you have a playlist, what do you really care for most of the times? Okay, what's the track? Who's the artist? What's the length of the track? Things like that. You wouldn't really uh, care like, uh, okay, well, the date of birth of the artist, right? Something like that. At least then, okay? So, let's take another example. The other example is I, I have playlists and playlist has an array of tracks which are track IDs. So what are these IDs? This is referring to a different track document. While it could be, while you can also consider nesting here, that is within the playlist, I also can have a partial embedded track document. So when I'm getting the playlist, I also get the track document, which is partially embedded. Let's talk about key design. So key design, so there's a choice again for you to choose the keys. You can choose between natural keys or you can choose uh, a surrogate key, which is not a natural key. So what are natural keys? Natural keys could be like phone numbers, usernames, social security numbers, account numbers, or most of the times they are a part of the document. Say a phone number is usually unique. So why not probably make that as a key? Email address is usually unique. Can I make that as a key? Social security number is unique, which is also a part of the document. Can I make that as a key? So the advantage here is, uh, Couchbase works the best or the fastest when you're getting the document by the key. So when you know the key, always get the document by the key instead of running a nickel query. So when you're running a nickel query, you know, I, if I know the key, okay, user colon 101, get of user colon 101, the fastest. Instead of doing, okay, select star from couch music where a user ID is equal to 101, then it's going to the query engine, going to the index engine, index engine, there's a fetch phase, get the documents sent to the query engine, then pass. Takes time. Of course, you have GSIs, you have MOIs, with all those things, but still, Getting by the key is always the fastest. So always you model the model the Couchbase key in such a way, or you model the entire document in such a way that I can possibly get the document by its key. But sometimes a uh, natural key might not be the best uh, key. Uh, the natural key might not be the best attribute for the key. So for example, let's talk about, for, for username, okay, phone number could be the best attribute, no problem, I can, uh, phone number is unique, but what about a pet? Pet does not have a phone number, right? So 
that's when you know I need to rely on some secondary keys say some keys that can be generated like SHA1 or UUIDs or some uh, atomic counters you know which Couchbase supports things like that so key patterns when you are using key patterns you know always you try to go with something like this uh, you specify which object model belongs to for example here you can see I tell that this is user profile object model colon the key name playlist colon the key so or it can be something like this the app colon the doc type colon the ID so I could say something like pizza colon user colon 101 so this enables multi-tenancy right so all the pizza documents are like pizza colon something while all the burger documents are like burger colon something okay so that kind of uh, enables multi-tenancy lookup pattern lookup pattern is the purpose of lookup pattern is to allow multiple ways to reach the same data say let's let's take this example look at this key it's not very easy to remember this key right so like I, I told earlier you get the key that's the best way how to retrieve the retrieve a couch page document but it's not easy to remember this key but however it's easy to remember or get through somebody's email address so what I do I have this document here that's fine I create another document I create a secondary document so what do I do with this document so the email address of this document the email address attribute of this document is the key here and the and the value part is the key of the main document so what I do is I get by this email address so I get this document and with this document key I again do a get to get the actual document so there are two gets but still I did a get so it's much faster so of course with nickel this is a technique that's probably reduced a bit where you had to maintain two different documents but still this works very very fast because it's just lookup you're creating a lookup key get the document key from there from this key you look up for the main document various trade-offs in data modeling uh, I would say there are four trade-offs document size atomicity complexity and speed document size we know that Couchbase supports a maximum of 20 megabyte documents again does not mean that your document has to be uh, 20 megabyte big so larger document makes takes more disk space more time to transfer across the network and more time to serialize and deserialize so we need to understand that so if you're dealing with large documents even we would say like one one, one MB or even I would say something above 100 KB it's like a large document you should probably consider you know do uh, you, separating into different documents so Couchbase works the best when it is uh, for a large say set of documents which are potentially you know of small size okay so you may also need to limit the number of dependent objects that you embed so that the document does not grow and grow and grow about atomicity we know that atomicity Couchbase does not support transactions okay very important so if you want transactional behavior you have to make sure that the fields lie within the same document because Couchbase is uh, atomic at the document level so Couchbase does not tran uh, support transactions so if you have to maintain any kind of transaction if you really want some kind of transactions it's it's your responsibility so you'll have to write code you'll have to maintain that code as well okay uh, we of course have uh, CAS uh, which is for optimistic locking you can take an advantage of that when you're doing some kind of transactional behaviors okay complexity of a document so uh, complexity affects every area of a software system including the uh, including data modeling the complexity of queries okay do you really require a nickel query there uh, the complexity of the code updating multiple copies of the same data so that is where you want you, you want to choose between nesting and non nesting the speed okay uh, so it really speed is very critical so when it comes to nickel okay you have choices to get the documents you can get the documents by get or you you can get using nickel with primary keys uh, primary indexes or you can get using GSI uh, you can get data using nickel using MOIs so you'll have to choose all those things wisely if you're choosing MSI you have to 
uh, MOI, you have to make sure your index node is properly sized because MOI is the whole index is there in the memory. You have to make sure the index is sized properly. So again, I would uh, say that you, you remember that HDK get is faster than the nickel with MOI, which is faster than nickel with GSI. Okay, so you model your document key such that the document can be retrieved with the key, if possible, than a nickel query. Okay, very important. Okay, so uh, I uh, the last one is uh, when do I go with embedded versus refer? So embedded when when the reads greatly overwrite outnumber the writes okay and if you're if you're okay with slim risk of inconsistent data okay you embed the uh, you can go with embedding and you're optimizing for speed with that speed for access okay uh, the reason is you do a single get and you get the entire document so you're optimizing there so again again I would say it's very important that you model your key there okay because key plays a very important role when you're dealing with you know the basic gets and sets Okay. So when do you refer? When consistency is a priority. Okay, you want uh, to be updated only in a single location. You do not want to do multiple updates and then you know have transactional kind of behavior or something like that. You you want consistency? Okay, you uh, you you refer. You use referring and you want to use cache efficiently because smaller documents. Each document is referring the other document. Okay. All right, so next steps, okay, uh, uh, we, you can, uh, if you have more questions, you can always uh, post in the forums, a couch base. We have the developer community. Uh, you can find uh, a documentation, tutorials for data modeling here. And of course, we recommend you to uh, attend the training. We have, three, uh, we have four trainings, CS300, that is the server administration training. We have the uh, data modeling, nickel data modeling training. We have the developing, developer training and we have the mobile application training. Okay, and of course we have a, a online training, a free online training. You can visit training.couchbase.com slash online, which is free online training and it's hands-on labs as well, okay? So free hand, hands-on training, okay, uh, online. So you can take it at your pace. So if you have more questions about the training, please visit our booth, okay? All right, thank you. We've got a couple minutes, couple minutes for uh, data modeling questions. Yeah. <laughs> Question for me? Well, that's, he's bringing a mic up. Just okay. a sec. Oh. Yeah. Actually, I actually got two unrelated questions. One is I saw several times you referenced uh, make sure you put an updated field in your in your things. We never actually talked about that. Can you briefly discuss what the use of that is? Uh, the updated field. So many times what happens, people want to maintain the consistency between two documents, right? So the way how people can maintain consistency between two doc documents is by having the updated field in the same document. So what if like the when you update this document, uh, it failed while the, while the first one succeeded. So if you have two updated fields in both the documents, you can always uh, compare them both and see if both the documents are of the same uh, updated time and uh, they are working fine. So that's a way how you can make sure that both the, do both the documents are consistent as well. Anyone else? Yeah. He's going there. Uh, hi, um, you just mentioned um, Cloud-based doesn't support transactions. So right. I, I would like to know, like, what's the common strategy for doing rollback yeah, or similar type? Is that uh, it's going to be a separate module on application level, or is yes. it going to be? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, so Couchbase definitely doesn't uh, does not support transactions. So if you have to uh, say enable transactional behavior, so you have to maintain additional code at your data layer. Yeah. By, by using CAS, you can use CAS also. CAS is used for optimistic locking. So uh, you do not, you, uh, the same document can, can be read by multiple people, but cannot be updated by the multiple people. It makes sure that there is no like dirty writes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was told by a colleague that the, um, the key space is recorded in a four byte B tree. And so he's telling me that uh, it's important to make sure the first four bytes are unique. Is that valuable or is that important? I did not get your question. Can you repeat um, that, please? He was saying basically the, the key, key space storage, so when you're indexing a document by key, yeah. um, I guess that's all recorded in a four byte B tree. 
is my understanding. Not so that I know. Four bytes. Nothing like that. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Okay. No. Yeah. Yeah, a question. Yeah. Um, you were saying that. Uh, Let's grab the mic, please. You were saying when uh, choosing a root attribute versus an embedded attribute that one of the reasons to choose an, an, an embedded attribute was because you can have a impartial index with where type equals hotel. Yeah. Um, can you accomplish the same thing with a root attribute if you do like where hotel is not missing? Where ho uh, hotel is not missing? Yes, uh, hotel is not missing. Uh, can you index on not missing attributes? Uh, I don't think so on not missing attributes. The attribute has to be available. <laughs> And to index. Looks like we're we're all done here, so we're out of time. But thanks for yeah. coming, and uh, we can take more questions outside. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.